Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for our second webinar in our IGNIS series. Today we're presenting Beyond Cutting and Pasting, Teaching Research Skills for the 21st Century, and we are joined by a group of lovely presenters whom we will introduce to you shortly. And um, we're hoping to ignite your curiosity today about research in the 21st century. And this series is brought to you by SBCTC eLearning and ATL. And my name is Alyssa Sells, and I'm the eLearning Program Administrator at the SBCTC. And my counterpart, my wonder twin, is Jennifer Wetham, who is the Program Administrator for Faculty Development. And she missed us last week because she was at a faculty retreat, but she's here joining us today, so that's great. And also Yay. joining us this afternoon is our Collaborate <laughs> Rep, Amber Goulart. And she has graciously agreed to um, help us with some of the background technical stuff, so um, we're very, very happy to have her here with us, and we're excited to offer this webinar series to you, and as I mentioned, this is our second in the series, so we're still kind of getting our marketing down and getting going, but last time I think went pretty well, and um, we'll get the hang of it, don't worry, we're kind of flying by the seat of our pants a little bit right now, um, but we'll get better as we go. And I want to thank our presenters for um, sharing their experience and their knowledge with us today, and to all of our participants also for attending our session. And we will be recording this session, because I did remember to start the recording. And I am putting the link to the you ATL lost blog. Audio. You lost my audio? Oh. So hmm. there's the link to the ATL blog. That's where you will be able to access the recording afterwards. We'll get that posted as soon as we get it. And um, we're just going to get started today by running through just a few quick things in Collaborate to get you familiar with the interface. So let me go ahead and advance to our next slide. If you'd like to use your audio today and have not already done so, please go ahead and run your audio wizard, and you'll find that in the tools menu. So go ahead and do that real quick, quick, and then um, you can click on talk to try speaking. We are set to four simultaneous speakers today so that we can't all be talking over each other at once. So um, if you're noticing that you're not able to speak at a certain time, it might be because all of the mics are turned on. And if that's the case, go ahead and raise your hand, and I'll show you how to do that here in just one second. And then um, we'll call on you, and you'll be able to talk. All right, moving on. Here are our tools for today. In the upper window, the audio video, you can see who is there. Some of us have static pictures. And our presenters are using their webcams today. So in just a minute, you'll actually see their pretty faces. Handsome faces for you, Will. And in the participants window, you can see who is joining us today. You can scroll through that list. There's also a chat window on the bottom left. You can enter um, anything, information for the group into the chat. We're going to use our web tools here in just a minute on our whiteboard. So um, let me show you a few extra slides. You'll need to know maybe where your emoticons are if you want to give us a thumbs up or some applause or a smiley face. If you need to step away, go ahead and click your step away button. If you want to raise your hand to speak, just put your hand up and we'll call on you. We are also going to use the polling tool. That's the little check mark box there. Um, we're going to do an ABC alphabet poll, so um, our icon in our actual interface is actually an A right now. Um, when you're speaking, you'll click your talk button. So um, when you see the little blue microphone, you'll know that you have your talk button clicked. And then you have some other permissions there. All right, so here is some information about the chat. The room chat is for the entire group. Go ahead and put all your questions and comments and anything you need to know in there. Amber and I and Jennifer will monitor that as our presenters are speaking. For our whiteboard tools, there's a skinny little toolbar right kind of in the center between the two panels. And I'd like you to find the icon that looks like a sun. We're actually going to use that as your pointer tool. So go ahead and click and hold the sun icon to select a pointer tool. We're going to use it on our next slide. But if you'd like to practice on this slide, please feel free to go ahead and do that. So um, just go ahead and find it and 
And if I click on a smiley face, I can put a smiley face in there. We're going to do it on for real on the next slide, but if you want to practice here, go ahead. Okay, so hopefully everybody's had time to grab their pointer tool. And we want to know where in Washington are you? And I'm going to find myself somewhere up here in Snohomish County. I'm in Everett, so I'll put my little smiley face right here. We're just kind of curious how far across the state we're spread. And um, actually, one of our presenters, um, Will, is joining us from um, not from Washington. So if you see his little check mark outside of Washington, that's because he's not in Washington. Okay. <laughs> All right. He, he's in, Will is in yeah. Vancouver. Um, next week. Oh, next, he is today. Okay. Next webinar, we're having somebody from Oregon. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought no, you're right. That's Zach. I'm sorry. Sorry, Will. I've been no doing too many webinar slides. Too many <laughs> webinar slides this morning. It's all one great big blob of webinar slides now. Okay, we have a great group. We've got people in Walla Walla, Yakima, all over. So um, last time we had somebody swimming in the ocean, so that was kind of funny. All right. So that just gave you a little introduction to the pointer <laughs> tool. Now we're gonna now we're gonna use our polling tool, tool, and we want to know who are you. you? Are you faculty, part-time or full-time? Are you an administrator? Are you staff? Would you fall in the other category, CBO partner, librarian, something else we um, might not be listing here? Go ahead and um, click your answer by using that A tool there, the little icon for polling. And I will go ahead and publish those results to the window here. Just one sec. It takes me just a second to find that. There we go. Okay, and there are our results. Lots of people didn't answer, but it looks like um, we do have a big group of other with us today. So um, that's interesting. Okay, that's kind of fun. Actually, right. now I'm thinking um, I should have made this list different. I re I'm realizing we. I sh it, this is my fault, you guys, because we put staff, and I should have put librarian for D, because <laughs> this is a research. So my apologies to all librarians in the room. Well, the librarians um, are on there. They're under other. They're there. They're <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay, um, just a quick note on meeting etiquette before um, we introduce you to the topic for today. So um, please do raise your hand when you'd like to speak so that we can call on you in a timely manner. Go ahead and use those emoticons to um, express approval or a job well done. Click your talk button when you do um, get called on and you're ready to talk, because if you don't click that button, we won't be able to hear you. And we're not going to interrupt our presenters while they're presenting. We're working off of a very loose Ignite format where our presenters are um, just going to go through their materials fairly quickly. But please do enter all of your questions into the chat box. You just type them right in as we're going. And that will keep them relevant to the presenter that's speaking. And then we'll go back and revisit those um, toward the end of the session in our Q&A. So let's go on. Um, Jen, I'm going to turn it over to you now. And um, when you're done with these couple of slides, then you can introduce the, the presenters. OK? Excellent. OK. Well, everyone, welcome. Um, thank you again. And thanks, Alyssa, for running us through that fun intro. Um, I just wanted to talk for a few seconds about teaching research in the 21st century. And um, you know, just thinking about that the potential audience for student research might be outside of academia, that students are highly capable and able to um, do what we might call, quote unquote, real life research in their undergraduate courses. Um, that research should always be contextualized and relevant to students' lives, um, that it's inquiry driven. Um, that it utilizes many different technologies, Twitter, Facebook, SurveyMonkey, YouTube, and that research um, can utilize many different genres, especially ethnography, interviewing, scholar, it doesn't have to be just scholarly sources. Um, and that the primary task, at least for me when I was a faculty member in English, I thought you know, that we're teaching students to filter information for quality and relevance and then use it for inquiry. Um, and that research is collaborative. The old way, I think, um, you know, I know 10 years ago um, or even 20 years ago when I was in school, the sole audience you know, was the teacher, um, that research was perceived as boring and irrelevant. Um, I love Bruce Ballinger's theory of the belief thesis that instead of students coming up with a thesis at the beginning of the research process, that they would engage in inquiry the entire 
process. Um, mono technology, that it might just use the word processor, um, that students might just use the word processor. Mono genre, that you know, research is limited to the scholarly source. Um, this idea that you have to actually go to the physical space of the library, you know, a lot of students log on to their libraries and chat with their librarians. Um, and then this mythology of the sole author. I think that um, this teaching students to research in this way prepares them to face um, adaptive challenges rather than technical problems. And just basically what I mean by adaptive challenges versus technical problems, a tech, um, the, the, the realities of the 21st, oh, there goes my thing. Um, just very quickly, an adaptive challenge, it's oftentimes hard to focus on what one problem might be. There might be many different perceptions as to what the problem is. And we don't always have the tools to solve those problems. A technical problem you know, would be something like putting a man on the moon. You know, you know when that goal is achieved. And in the 60s, we had all the technology to do that. Um, and that's all I'm going to say for right now. So. I'm sure you can read the slides on your own. Um, Zach, I see you too are a fan of Bruce Ballinger. <laughs> so um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our um, presenters. And by the way, I love the comments on the chat. That's so fun and helpful. Um, so first up, we have Allison Inudris. She's the e-learning director at Everett Community College. And she's going to talk about MOOCs, OER, and cell phone polls, helping student researchers slow down the flood of sources. Next up, then, we have Heather Jean Ewell, who's a librarian at Everett. And she's going to give us a fantastic um, presentation on using Zotero, which I could have, <laughs> I would have highly um, loved when I was teaching. And then finally, William S. Durden, um, an English professor from Clark. College and my colleague down at Clark, connecting the dots using hyponymies and partonymies to establish a knowledge base. And Will, I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. So Allison, when you're ready, you can take it. Oh, sorry. Don't look at that. Pretend no one saw that. Um, all right, Allison, when you're ready, we can take it away. OK, hi, everyone. Um, I want to thank Alyssa and Jen for this opportunity. And, and I'm really thankful that I don't have to follow Heather. <laughs> so um, my name is Allison Adrianos, as she mentioned. And I am the e-learning director at Everett Community College. And you may wonder, um, what does an e-learning director have to say about 21st century research? Um, well, I'm coming at this as a background. I was an English teacher for 10 years, and I have a master's in English. And I went back to school to uh, earn a master's in education. And in that transition, um, I was still teaching as, a, um, as an English teacher. And so I started getting more interested in educational technology. And, um, and so I come from this as a, as a perspective, not only as an e-learning director, but I, um, I was an I-5 flyer, for those of you that are joining us in the audience and know what that's like. And so Anything that I'm talking about today, I'm hoping that you can use either on a sabbatical, should you be so lucky to get one, or if you want to make small changes to your course. Um, so please feel free to contact me as, um, after the presentation if you have any questions. But basically, I wanted to look at ways to engage students because when I started, um, and many of you in the audience today, this was where you started for ideas when you were a researcher. And um, I learned over the years that I had to change my way of researching because the student and the technology had changed. And what I was really finding um, interesting when I was working with students is that their teachers were telling them not to use Wikipedia, not to use Google, and that they thought it was just like this way of cheating. And I was like, no, that's how research works. And so basically what I had to do is teach the students that this is how we used to do it. And I remember telling, um, I was present when an anecdote was being told by a librarian to the students about using the card catalog. Well, the students had no idea what that was. And one of the students uh, Googled um, what a card catalog was, and a desk from the Pottery Barn came up. And she came up and asked me um, what that even meant. And so I realized, OK, that anecdote doesn't work anymore. So what can we do? And so um, I was in a presentation at the Humanities, um, uh, the Humanities Washington. And there was a great speaker named Dave Deren. And he talked about creative Googling. And so I love that. 
idea as a teacher and as a researcher, but for students, it's overwhelming. So for instance, I did a search yesterday on 21st century research skills, and I've got 15 million hits. All right, great, I'm ready to get started. But basically what happens is this is how students feel. Or they use the top three not realizing that they aren't scholarly or that they won't work for their, um, their research. And so it's just so much information, right? Um, on the one hand, the internet is a wonderful thing. Databases are amazing, but it's just so much to handle. And I only have them for 10 weeks. And basically, when you talk to teachers about teaching research, um, I love this Venn diagram because teachers are like Bono in this, in this Venn diagram. We want the students to engage with books and, and research and the library, but we also love the technology. And basically, we're at a point where there's just so much, right? So what can we possibly do in the 10 weeks? And so I started to think about ways that I could change my 102 class. And as I was in my program and I was learning new ways of researching in the education field, I came into discovering MOOCs, right? And everybody was, oh, the MOOCs are going to take over. We're going to lose our jobs. And so I love this poster that basically talks about um, MOOCs being the big blob that's going to end uh, uh, education as we know it. And all I have to say to that is that they are great, but if you really want a one-to-one -one engagement with your students, the first thing that MOOC teachers tell you is don't contact the teacher. Now, I realize that um, there are different situations when MOOCs can work amazingly. I know that someone in this audience has taught an amazing MOOC, and so I'm not anti-MOOC, but what I am trying to get across to teachers is that you can use it for great resources. So um, MOOCs have a 3% completion rate, and I'm part of the problem. I'm signing up for classes because I want to get their research and I want to see their course design. And I'm basically, I guess, what you could call stealing. <laughs> um, but I, we call that collaboration, right? We call that collaboration in research. And so basically, you can go into a MOOC and there's, there's a class right there ready and it's open and it's available. And so if you're looking to spice up your 102 class or your research, find a MOOC that connects to your course theme. I taught food sustainability and there was, I was lucky enough that there was a MOOC being available at that time, I had the students take the MOOC together and report back to the class. And I promise you that the MOOC will not upstage you as the teacher. They really just love getting the resources, and it cuts down that conversation about how to find good sources, because MOOCs often give students more than you can possibly manage to learn in the, in the space of the, the class. That's, the, that's the, the essence of a MOOC. So when I had students sign up for a MOOC, I signed up, but I, wasn't, I didn't have time to do the work, and so I would just listen to them, and I encouraged them to collaborate. I also put them uh, in uh, another, another way for them to learn about using resources that are for free on the internet, right, is to use open education. And I started, it's open education resources, but it's actually research. And the best thing that I feel like you can do as an English teacher is to have them create the least you need to know about APA and MLA. Put them into groups, put the, separate them by social sciences, humanities, sciences, whatever their futures are, and have them make that least you need to know and then they can carry those to different classes. You can also, another free resource online that was wildly successful with my online, with my 102 class, was I had them do readings and I had them use PhotoPin, which is an open source for photos, and I had them find an image that represented something about their reading. So I got some great images from the students. If we were talking about the slow food movement and students didn't know what that meant, they didn't understand about food sustainability, and one of the students found this picture of the Pike Place Market, and the student said, you know, I'm glad that uh, this article made me see the farm I drive by every day in a new way. I had no idea we, Pacific Northwest, are so innovative. I'm glad I live here. And all the students did was put in the keywords, sustainability and food, into the photo pin search. So again, teaching skills about, you know, searching and using images. And then, right, another tool that we can put to use is cell phones, right? Um, the, the, so the students are coming to our class being told cell phones are bad, don't use them, put them away. Um, and, you know, to a large extent, this is how the cell phone came into the class, like it or not, right? And I can identify with students here. Um, I, when I was in classes in high school and college, for better or for worse, for my GPA, I was writing notes um, to my friends, to my boyfriend. I was not paying attention, but I looked like the model student. So had texting existed at that time, I would have been right there with this young woman here. 
So what can we do? We have this tool, right? We, we talk about MOOCs. We talk about all of this amazing technology that we have via the Internet. But we've got this little tiny device that almost every student has. And if they don't have it, then they're willing to share. The students will collaborate with one another. So this idea of being scared about, oh, my phone isn't cool. Nobody cares anymore. Um, and they're happy to help one another out. So how can I use the cell phone? So this is what I decided. I started to look into cell phone polls. Eye clickers were all the rage a couple of years ago, and I have to admit I'm anti-eye clicker. They're expensive. They're really time consuming for teachers. They're impossible to learn if you uh, do not have a constant support system. It's going to drive your IT and media services people up the wall. And honestly, by the time the teacher gets all of the content into the cell phone poll, it's obsolete. There's a new, de you know, there's a new addition to the book. It's kind of maddening. So a way to get teachers involved in using this kind of technology I started to look into cell phone polls, and I use Poll Everywhere. Um, that's my favorite. There are a few others if you Google a cell phone poll. Um, you can write questions on the fly to students. You can help students be a part of the research process. And basically, you can find out a lot about your students. So here in this slide, I have my students. I was breaking them up into uh, five groups. And nobody signed up for the wiki builders. I wanted to know why. They all thought that they were going to be thrown in prison with Julian Assange because I was asking them to be a part of Wikilinks. They didn't know what a wiki was. So um, it was a real learning moment for me to teach them what I actually wanted them to do. Like I said, it's a great gateway for iClickers. If you have faculty members who want to use this technology but they're intimidated, you model good quality research questions. It's great for presentations. You can get a sense of who's in the audience. I wanted to talk about Pinterest and using Pinterest for research. And it would have been really terrible for that 60% if they didn't know what Pinterest was. And basically, you can work with this idea that you have 10 weeks to get knowledge and skill and ability to students. So what do I want them to learn? I want them to understand what it means to write a quality research question, to write thesis statements, and to identify, at the very least, what an APA and MLA citation practice looks like. And I want them to understand that research is lifelong learning. When I ask students, what do you like to learn about in your free time, they look at me like I'm nuts, first of all, uh, when I tell them that if you look into World of Warcraft or even monster truck races, <laughs> believe me, I've had that, um, they do focus on their, their little small group. Basically, they, they research in their free time, and they don't realize that they're actually using the skills that we want them to learn in college. And I want them to get out of my class that research is something that you all see good at or you wouldn't be here, right? You wouldn't be a college student. So there's my 10 minutes of Ignite, and feel free to contact me about any questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Allison. Um, we'll revisit questions for her in um, the Q&A session. If you have something that's burning that you want to get down, go ahead and type it into chat for us. And I'm going to turn it over to Heather Jean now. Awesome. Thanks, Alyssa. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes, Thumbs up. Awesome. OK. So I'm so grateful to be here today. I just want to thank everyone who's putting on this webinar. It's so wonderful to be able to come together with a group of folks interested in research in the 21st century. And um, I'm also really excited because I adore Zotero. And so I'm super excited to be able to give a presentation about it, sort of the Zotero evangelist for my institution. Anyway, Zotero, what is it? Um, it's basically a free citation management software that allows you to collect information about anything, physical objects, online objects. And then it helps you organize, cite, and curate that information that you've collected about whatever it is that you're using, from online images to uh, websites. And so some, some folks um, might be wondering, Zotero, what's, what does that mean? It's actually based on an Albanian word that means um, to acquire or to master. And it's the brain baby of the Roy Rosenweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. And so um, some of you might be thinking, or probably not this group, but some other groups I've talked to, citation management software? Nor. And so, oh, it looks like my um, animated GIFs aren't working. The kitty should be falling asleep right now and snoring. Um, anyway, so um, how awesome is Zotero? It's so awesome that um, basically, uh, oh, um, anyways, uh, so uh, some of you might have actually had bad experiences with uh, uh, 
citation software. Um, has anyone used? Uh, and no, I know one person um, in particular who has been scarred for life by EndNote. Anyways, um, moving on. Uh, again, the, the image would normally animate, and Cinderella's head would explode because this hero is that awesome. It makes librarians' head ex explode. Anyway, so getting on to um, how the tarot works, um, I'm actually going to swap out for a second and show you folks um, through application sharing my Zotero collection. I've got some backup slides in case uh, the internet fails us, but here we go. All right, can everybody see um, my um, library's homepage here? Yes? OK, awesome. So um, there are multiple forms of Zotero, but the one that I like the most is the browser plugin. And so um, what happens when you have the browser plugin installed, and I'll tell you more about that later, in the bottom right corner here you'll see Zotero. Click on that and boom, your um, collection interface will pop up. And here's how it works. I've been told it's very similar to um, the iTunes, so off on the left here, you have folders that represent collections that you've created. When you click on a folder in the center area here, it brings up all the citations for things that you've collected inside of that folder. Um, notice that there are little toggles next to the citation. Uh, when you toggle that, it shows you documents that you might have attached to it. What's cool about Zotero is it actually saves the uh, snapshot of the website that you might have gotten that information from. You can also attach the full text or the PDF of that article directly to that citation, which I think is really cool. And so um, in addition to the center pane, off to the right here, you see um, uh, additional information about that citation that you've collected. And so um, another cool thing about um, the fact that it collects all the information is that you can actually attach notes. So instead of having to have like a separate Word document somewhere with all of your notes about your um, citation, you can actually attach all of those notes to your citation and um, they're keyword searchable. Other cool things, um, you can create your own social tags to describe your uh, research Zotero will make those for you based on keywords, but if you, say, wanted to attach a tag for a specific assignment um, and then have the citations in multiple folders, you could do that. One of my favorite things is uh, the related tab. So that actually allows you to connect this resource to another resource. So um, it might mention another thing that you've read, and you can um, associate them with one another. So if you forget, ah, what's that book? I know it's related to this. I remember reading it. I can save that relationship there, and it's there for me whenever I need it. Another cool thing, everything's keyword searchable. So if I can't remember where I put that thing on Japanese theater, I can just go ahead and uh, Google it, and it'll bring up all of my citations that are about Japanese theater. And it can be incredibly helpful. Um, but here's the coolest thing I want to tell you about. The way that um, Zotero can harvest citation data for you. So instead of having to like manually enter all of the, uh, like the title, the author, all of that, you can actually use the Zotero plugin to um, find it for you and then um, collect it for you. So here I am at my library homepage. I'm going to go into our catalog and I'm going to look up uh, Shinto, so um, indigenous Japanese religion. Um, when I have the Zotero plugged in to my browser, see that little file folder icon right at the end of the browser link? If I click on that, it allows me to um, see that, oh, there are multiple citations on this page that Zotero is sensing. So I can collect, um, collect multiple and then I can add them into my research library, and boom, they are there, they are in there. A year in the life of Shinto, there it is. And look, it's pulled all of the information, title, author, place of publication, date, ISBN number, whatever was available on the page is now automatically imported into my collection. If you're just looking at a single item, again, you'll see that little icon pop up. It's sensing that this is a book. But if ever it makes a mistake, you can just click inside here and you can change any and all of the information. And it's just so cool. 
Um, another cool thing is that you have some other options. So um, you might have an ISBN number for a resource. You can add it to your collection by identifier using this little guy here. You can also just create a snapshot of the web page you're looking at right now. And again, like I said, it'll save a picture of your website. So if the website um, goes missing, it just gets pulled, or maybe it gets updated or edited, it will save that snapshot for you, and it'll stay there for you no matter what you do. And so um, moving on. OK, so I'm going to switch back to my slides now for a second. And OK, I'm going to pop through these really quick because we went over them. Um, oh, uh, another cool thing that Zotero allows you to do is generate bibliographies for whatever it is that you want. And so um, in the collections that we were just looking at, you can either select um, the folder itself or the individual citation. And then you can create a bibliography or a uh, in-paragraph citation with just one click. And it contains all of the, the major citation forms, APA, MLA, um, and it's been constantly updated by the folks who create the software. Anyways, other cool things that Zotero can do is it can store documents. So you can actually upload your PowerPoint slides, your um, Word documents, whatever it is that you want to be able to store online in your collections, you can do it. Um, one of the greatest things about Zotero <laughs> is that it is synced through the internet. And so um, whatever you collect at your work computer, if you've got it set up at your home computer, it'll follow you back there. So um, you can even um, sync on your cell phone. I've got my collection set up so that I can look at them online as well. And, um, and not only that, there's a social feature. So um, you can create public collections that you can then share online. You have complete control over how much access people have. So um, you can have a research group working with you. Um, and not only will it, you be allowed to share, you can also create um, free online websites that folks can then access. So did I mention um, that it connects to our information literacy and um, uh, technology literacy uh, learning outcomes? It's a great way to engage with your students. Um, and it's free. Free, free, free. But there are some limitations. It's free up until a point. Um, I've been using it for almost six years now, and only just recently did I reach my storage limit. So you can see you get a, uh, 300 megabytes free. There are some quirks with other browsers, but you can work around those. Uh, and citation harvesting may not work with every web page, but just find another source and harvest that way. Interested? Step one, go to zotero.org and register. Step two, download and install that plugin. I recommend starting with that. Step three, set up your options. And step four, become a citation wizard. I am a citation wizard. Please ask me about Zotero. It's a great way to engage your students with um, this collecting urge that they're already experiencing through Pinterest and Tumblr. Why not connect that with academia through research and take it to the next level? Anyways. Um, so many, so many great questions about Zotero. Um, please ask me, and I'd be happy to tell you more. Uh, thank you so much for your interest. And I love questions. Ask me questions. I'm here to help. All right. Thank you so much, Heather Jean. Um, William, you're up now. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. And you can screen share or web tour or whatever you plan to do. And just a reminder to everybody to please type your questions. Uh, burning questions into our chat, and we'll revisit those um, in the Q&A session at the end of um, the next presentation. Thanks. Take it away, Will. Hi, everybody. Sorry about my cold. I've got kind of a lower voice than usual, but whatever. Um, I'm going to pull up the presentation here and just walk you through something that I, I use in my, in my courses. So this is called Connecting the Dots, and we're looking at using hyponymies and partonymies to establish a knowledge base. This is informed by a cognitive science-based approach to language and thought. It's designed as part of a 10-week humanities-based research project. Uh, I think all Washington Community Colleges would call that an English 102 course. Um, so I want you to know the inception where that came from. Oh, that's not good. One moment. So 
sorry for these difficulties. I don't know what's happening here. It's kind of not so good. FAI application sharing appears to be on. That's an active screen we have. So what, what do I need to do to fix this problem? I'm not sure I understand what's happening. Is this working? Are people able to see this? Yeah, we're on your overview slide right now. Great. So this can be used in multiple stages, but it's most appropriate during a background knowledge research phase. So the importance here is that it helps to formulate and answer a question. How do I come to terms with what I've learned and find out what I still need to know? The two structures can be thought of like this. A hyponymy is a kind of hierarchy, and I use that if I'm looking for a larger perspective on my subject, so I call that an airplane view. A partonymy is a part whole hierarchy, and so that's if I want to actually get below, kind of below the surface, as it were, and get a more microscopic view of some aspect of my subject. Hyponymies start with basic level terms, words that are simple in form, learned early in life, and evoke rich images. So it's a great starting point as students are doing research to not have to think that they need to work with really complex terms right away, because you actually get to complex terms fairly quickly. To demonstrate, we're going to just use the term fat, the word fat, and begin with the observation that it's used in everyday language to refer to both body and dietary fat. For a research project, we might want to find out the relationship between body fat and dietary fat. Why is the same word used to designate two different things? I've chosen to use this as a sample because the, you know, quote unquote topic of obesity is really popular with students right now. A lot of people want to tackle it. And so I try to show them ways that we want to complexify that right away and not just trust kind of surface level information that we can find easily. So a hyponymy is a kind of hierarchy, and we begin with kind of formulations. So we might start with something like this. Dietary fat is a kind of macronutrient, whereas body fat is a kind of stored energy. To get a sense of what dietary fat is, then we can create a hyponymy informed by our research. So this does assume a certain level of background research already done that includes basic level terms, superordinate terms, and subordinate terms. Here's an example of that fleshed out. We might realize by doing some of this work, by trying to fit this information that we have into a hyponymy, that there's other terms that are kind of synonymous or work on the same level as dietary fat, like protein and carbohydrates, and that there's a group, that there's a higher order conceptual grouping for that, referred to as macronutrients. And then on the subordinate level, we're able to break those things down as well. And I've kind of highlighted with red the path that I would choose to continue to research. Once we have a hyponymy or an airplane view in place, we can construct a partonymy, a microscopic view for any term that we want to further inspect, in this case, triglycerides. So partonymies are similarly constructed to hyponymies, but we look to explore the parts of a term or expression. If hyponymies help us zoom out, then partonymies help us zoom in. And here's a set, again, a brief, and it's truncated. It's an example of a partonymy, triglyceride family. What are the different parts of this family? And the thing that I did, this was this is kind of a selective view, but I included some question marks. You know, other things are, are left off, of course. But as students are constructing this from the knowledge that they've gained from research, they'll start to see holes. Like, oh, as I'm putting this tree together, I'm realizing that I don't know much about saturated fatty acids, or I don't know much about monounsaturated fatty acids. And so those are places where I might want to go back and try to do more research, whereas my polyunsaturated fatty acids acids research prove more promising and I've got more places to go with that, right? That's basically it in a nutshell. After establishing the hyponymy and partonymy for dietary fat, we can duplicate that process for body fat. And through brainstorming conceptual groupings, we can start to see some of the differences and complicate that term. So we realize that body fat is on the same level as lean body mass, that those are part of the body composition conceptual grouping. And then it's at that subordinate level, again, that we might start to search and do some more research. Once we put together our partonymy for that, we realize the complexity of the issue of storage of fat, what it looks like, what contributes to it. And again, this is, this is really you know, shortened and selective. Uh, and what I didn't show was soft links, places where you started to make some connections, but where you weren't really sure where the research was taking you. I think that's really great, because we realize that there's things like leptin, which is a hormone that we don't necessarily know a ton about, or it's not easy to get that information. So we start to see places where we can really uh, get to the fringes of a knowledge base. So ultimately, this, you know, where I want with my students is we want to be in a place where we can discover what we know and what we don't and how that's related and what is known and what is not known in a field so that we can be more confident about our inquiries 
what we're trying to prove, what we can't prove, what we're trying to demonstrate, explain, whatever. Uh, Partonomies and hyponymies help us get there. So just as a, a basic overview to end, hyponymies elaborate kind of relations and are useful for airplane views. Partonomies elaborate part whole relations and are useful for microscopic views. And then, of course, I've got my sources like a good researcher there at the end. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much. And Jen, I'm going to turn it over to you now and let you um, moderate the Q&A. Yep, much applause to everybody. Yes, and I just want to write, thank you, Will. <laughs> um, so I'm just looking, um, I know somebody brought up a really interesting point about accessibility in terms of finances um, after Allison's uh, talk about cell phones, and I feel like that might be a really interesting point for discussion. Um, I didn't see I didn't see a lot of questions. I saw more comments, and I'm just wondering um, if somebody wants to type into the chat window. Like, where where are we interested in having more discussion? Go for it, Allison. Yeah, I I'll just I I saw what Dana wrote, and I I I completely understand. Um, and I think it's on the teacher and on the moderator of the use of the technology to be aware of that. Um, I mean, certainly everybody can afford a, a smartphone, um, but you can encourage people to, to share. And so even in that faculty meeting that you were talking about, or even the situation of students, um, you know, people just scoot together and you share your, your idea and the other person texts it. Um, and I, so I think it can work where you can be sensitive to people's technology and um, I just think it's a better model than the eye clickers. Um, a lot of institutions are moving to the model where they won't, um, you, you can't check them out. You have to buy them as a student. And they're $45. And my students, they were like, what am I going to do with this? So one of the students made a joke and made, a, uh, made two of them into a pair of earrings. Because what do you, <laughs> it's a piece of technology you'll never use again um, outside. So um, that's more of what I'm advocating for. So I'm sorry. I mean, in the Ignite session, it's hard to, elaborate, but I would never put a student in a situation or a faculty member in a situation where someone felt left out because of the technology. I think it can work. It's just a matter of how you moderate it. I'm happy to talk more about that as well. I just wanted to add a little bit. Yeah, well said, Allison. Um, I think you're right that, um, yeah, you know, so, and I'm just thinking out loud here, you know, I'm seeing Dana's comment, you know, I know we can share, but I think we create a culture of exclusion when we make expensive tools standard operating procedure. And I'm also seeing some people weighing in in the chat room um, that a lot of schools are now loaning these out. And I'm just wondering, what what kinds of things do, are, have other people, ex are, are, are other campuses having this conversation? Or have, do other people have experiences or tips that they'd like to share about this stuff, about this issue? Sorry, not stuff. <laughs> um, I, I also, maybe some actions needed on the state level. I know that, um, yes, thank you, Carol. Carol's saying she has to go. We'll tell my colleagues. Good. I, I know that. Um, there's another issue with cell phones that it would be the topic of another webinar, but the um, the accessibility from for students with um, with physical handicaps, and so um, you know, like sometimes if if someone's using a mobile device in a classroom, you know, students who have maybe vision um, who are vision impaired have trouble using the technology, and so we actually have an accessibility task force here at the state board that's comprised of faculty and um, other staff. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to like formulate my thoughts, but also I'm looking at the chat window. I know some state legislators who would be very interested in how they could help level the playing field for use of technology. Yeah, um, Jonathan, I think that's a great, that's great. And if you don't mind shooting a quick email maybe after <laughs> the webinar, that would be a fascinating, that would be interesting for me to follow up on um, because it is an issue of faculty professional development, I think. Um, let's see, so someone is uh, is coming in on the, <laughs> somebody just volunteered Jonathan to write a grant proposal. 
So it looks like Deb, you, Deb Moore, I can't keep up with the fact, oh, let's see, we have Land School in our instruction room, which has a built-in clicker type feature. Um, Debbie, do you, do you um, is, are, is this a comment, is this a question? Is land school, um, oh, just a comment, okay, okay. Um, is land school like a, is that like a clicker technology? Ah, uh, okay, okay, good. Are there um, other questions for Allison or, or Heather or for Will? You guys are a quiet, thoughtful group today. <laughs> I think Absolutely. Gabe made a comment early on that um, he said research is difficult in a quarter system. Uh, would anybody care to expand on that? Maybe um, Heather, Jean, you want to share on that? Go ahead. Um, I uh, actually uh, saw a question from Liz Falconer about Zotero. Do you mind if I field that? Absolutely. Go ahead. Go right ahead. Oh, thanks. Hey, uh, Liz, you asked how long did it take to get up to speed with Zotero? Um, it's very intuitive. Um, they have some really excellent um, tutorial materials on Zotero.org. There are video, um, video components to take you through the whole process. They've chunked it very well in terms of conceptually what do I need to know how to do first, what do I need to know how to do second. The browser plugin is the easiest one to experiment with because literally you can just get it set up inside of your browser and then start collecting and start playing around with the interface. And um, uh, I, I would say that it became almost second nature to me within a couple of days of using it. And so um, does that help to hear or um, did you have a, another question specifically? Oh, um, Karen's got an interesting question about a uh, public computer with Zotero. There's actually an online way to access your collections um, that doesn't require that the browser plugin be in use. Um, if you go to Zotero.org, if you have your profile already set up, you can access it just through the general web and you can still collect and use your um, citations that way without having to have um, a browser plugin synced to your actual collection. It looks like there's an interesting comment um, from Jonathan, since Zotero is a plugin for Firefox, to yeah. Firefox, there might be a problem. Heather, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, do you mind if, uh, that's an excellent question and one that I actually talked with our IT specialist here in the library about. Do you mind if I co-browse again for just a second to show something? Um, uh, uh, I'll make it very, very brief. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. We have plenty yeah. of time. Go right ahead. Yeah, go right ahead. So like I uh, mentioned, um, you can actually access your collections without having to have the browser plugin. Uh, the, the harvesting is the best part about it. Um, and I know that that, um, it, that would definitely be a loss for trying to do Zotero instruction. Um, you might be able to work out something with um, a, uh, with your IT department to get um, maybe a laptop cart or a lab to show students how to set up those um, browser plugins and at least get their profiles created and teach them how to sync so that when they're using um, their, uh, their uh, laptop at home or um, maybe you could talk with your IT administrator about um, their actual um, profiles that they use to log into specific computers if your institution is doing that. Some institutions have just open access computer labs. Some require that you have um, an actual username and password set up. If that's the case, if they've got a unique way of accessing um, a desktop that's specifically theirs, that might be a way of setting up the browser plugin and being able to use that no matter what station they um, sit down at. But like I said, um, 
in addition to uh, the browser plugin, you can just use the general internet to get to your collections. And I'm outing my personal email address here, but I know we're all good people. So if you really want to email me at home, you can. Um, anyway, so um, I am now just using the internet to access my Zotero collections. I'm not using my browser plugin. And so by clicking on my profile, I'll be able to see my collections. And this is how I access my collections at public libraries if I don't have my laptop with me. This is how I access it from another friend's computer if I don't happen to have my cell phone. Or this is how I got it in Japan just recently when I went over to do some research. And I didn't have my computer or my cell phone, and none of that worked. I can still use the general internet connection to be able to get at my collections and to add and to edit. So there are some possibilities here. One of the great things about Zotero is that it has so many manifestations that there's a, a bit of flexibility there. I'm going to stop my co-browse now because I don't want to um, uh, dominate the question and answer uh, session of this. So No, no, no. Um, that's, it was great. Um, there, it looks like there's a question from Renee. Um, does Allison have a list of ongoing MOOCs that someone could use with their classes? Um, many MOOCs that I've been in seem to end on specific dates and may not open up again. I gr I'm glad in school there was a Walking Dead MOOC. <laughs> oh, zombies. Oh, Liz is saying MOOC list. MOOClist.com. Oh, it look, sorry, it looks like Allison left the room. It, but it looks like our participants. So there's MOOClist.com, something akin to that. You can browse Canvas or Cours browse Canvas or Coursera for free MOOCs. Um, oh, it looks like Allison is back. Allison, um, do you have suggestions for MOOCs? She might need to run her audio setup. Oh, OK. Again. While we wait for her, I'm just going to point I don't out know, that it looks like she got kicked out. Oh, OK. Um, while we wait for her to get kind of synced up, um, just in case people have to leave right at 3 o'clock, I did put the SurveyMonkey link, and so did Alyssa, for the webinar feedback. And if you could just take a few minutes to fill out the survey, um, your feedback would really help us. Like, I'm clearly learning that I need to get better multitasking skills. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. Um, while we're waiting, Alyssa has put up, um, I put together these resources that I found helpful. I really like Bruce Ballinger's book, The Curious Researcher. Um, if you're looking for help helping, um, especially with helping students form inquiry questions, I found that to be really useful. Um, Malcolm Gladwell has a great TED talk called Choice, Happiness, and Spaghetti Sauce that it's kind of a fun TED talk about the nature of research and the importance of asking the right question. Um, Brené Brown, um, her TED talk on the power of vulnerability, I would often show this to students at the beginning of English 102 to sort of help them debunk their um, ideas about research being staid or boring or isolated from their real lives. And she also uses um, Facebook in interesting ways to gather research. And she's a very good qualitative researcher. Um, and she's funny. So. Um, Writing Commons is an OER source that has great, great, great assignments um, and handouts, all kinds of teaching materials for people who teach writing. And it's all open access, and it's really great. So Writing Commons. And then most of you probably already know about the Purdue OWL, but I feel like I would be amiss if we didn't give it a little plug. Um, students really love it. Um, I I really found the materials to be helpful when I was a beginning teacher, um, just to sort of help me learn how to teach students better. So, and of course, if people have other resources, um, feel free to type them into the chat window. Um, Allison, are we are we back with you? I think she might be having okay. some trouble with her mic, but she said she would suggest Coursera. She typed it into the chat. Oh, great. And yeah. um, she mentioned um, the Canvas MOOCs also. Oh, great. OK. Oh, I see that. Sorry. OK. Good, good. So are there, um, I see there's a question about, oh, Alyssa, you answered it. <laughs> about the eight, yes. I go ahead and address it for everybody so they know. Oh. 
Okay, um, so Jenna Liu um, asked, Williams asked about, will you make available the slides for presenters? And Alyssa said, yes, on the ATL blog, um, you'll find the presentations from any presenters who wish to share them. And we're also hoping to get a static site on the SBCTC website where you can find them. But, um, and I will also send them out through the ATL listserv. Um, so if you're not signed up for that, um, just shoot me a quick email. Um, I'll type my email address into the little thing here. Just shoot me a quick email, and I would be happy to sign you up for the ATL listserv. Um, oh, and Amber is showing Jana how to save. So it looks like if you go to Window and then File, Transfer Library, you can save the PowerPoint slides. So that is helpful. I didn't know that. Um, okay, so Alyssa, um, yes, yeah, oh, and here's my program, here's my information right here and the link to the blog and follow me on Twitter. Um, okay, so it's about 2.56. Are there any last questions before we, before we conclude? Um, it looks like Jana wanted the, um, the, the ones from the presenters, not just the overview slides. Um, Janet, we can we can send this to you privately via email, or we, we can work we can work that out. So as everyone's leaving, um, just Alyssa and I want to say thank you for coming, and thank you to our wonderful presenters. And um, please, 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 um, if you could just take a few seconds and just fill out the um, survey, it would be wonderful, um, just so we can keep refining and honing this series so it better suits, suits your needs. And thank you, presenters. Um, I want to, here's my applause. <laughs> and also, um, please join us for our next webinar, which is Ignite eLearning. And um, that will be on March 6th, and that'll be in the same webinar room, and it'll be, it's a Thursday, and it's from 2 to 3. Yes, and Liz Falconer, who is here today, will be one of our presenters, and Zach Hudson, who I, I think was here today, um, and then Rosemary Regal from Centralia. So I think it'll be another exciting lineup and a lot of great information. All right, everyone, thank you. Let's stop our recording now.